Money FM 89.3, best of weekends. Joining us on uh, on the line now, Professor Thomas Sudoff, who is the uh, Avram Goldstein Professor in the School of Medicine and School of uh, Molecular and Cellular Physiology at the University at Stanford University School of Medicine. And uh, Professor Sudoff joins us today, led to work in a Nobel Prize in in physiology and medicine in 2013. Don't jump over that a uh, Nobel uh, Prize I, I'm you, we winner, go, we the go first for, on this show, I believe. We go for the big guns, Professor. Professor Sudov, great to have you with us today. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me, actually? Does we, this work? We can. Hey, do you have your Nobel Prize certificate or anything in front of you? Is it Or your medal? Do you have anything uh, with you? No, I'm <laughs> Darn it. I, I, would, I would wear it. <laughs> I, I would have it made into a hat and just wear it every day. That's what you copy. Well, Professor Sudov, we have to mention that one of the reasons we're talking today is that you are taking part in the Global Young Scientists Summit 2021, which runs next week uh, between the 12th and the 15th. And, and uh, your your presence today is is being brought to you brought to us by the National Research Foundation here in Singapore. So we want to give credit where credit is due. But tell us a little bit about your work in, in, in a way that you know us normal human beings and not not amazing people like you could understand uh, what you've been working on and what you've discovered. Yeah, Professor. Before you start, you're talking to a man who cannot wear a medical mask properly <laughs> without breaking. <laughs> So, you know, for laymen like me. Consider the audience. Yeah. But, but please, uh, Professor, go ahead. I can only assure you that my masks always break through. <laughs> my, my glass is fog and I hate it. And to digress for a moment, I am really happy we're going to have a vaccine. And I think that that's the true testimony to why science is actually important and why basic research is important. Because... You know, there wouldn't have been a vaccine if there hadn't been scientists long before corona emerged who were working on these viruses, which is not my area of expertise, but they were slaving away on viruses that were thought to be completely useless, you know, completely blue sky work. And now then it happens. And all of a sudden that work became the foundation of all of the vaccines that we are now developing. My own work deals with how cells in the brain communicate with each other. I'm interested in how these cells process information by talking to each other. You have to imagine that the brain is just like a computer, except that it's not like a computer. It's like a computer because it's composed of a lot of little units that are connected into networks, and information flows through these networks. It's not like a computer because these networks can change their plastic. They change at the level of the connections continuously. And these changes at the level of connections make the brain so incredibly magic in terms of how it works. It enables the brain to process more information than you would expect the brain to be able to process information. And so this is really what I'm interested in. Is I'm interested in trying to understand better how these cells work communicate with each other at their connections. How does this actually work? How is that plasticity achieved that makes it possible for the brain to learn, to adapt? And what happens in disease when that goes wrong? Professor Sidov, about the only word that I know in this discussion right now, I think, is the word synapse. Is, is, that, is that what you deal with, uh, broadly speaking, the synapses and how they connect with each other? Exactly. That's exactly it. So when you look at these connections between cells, there are specific junctions where two cells fundamentally physically connected. And that's where the information transfer happens, and these connections are called synapses. Yes. And at a synapse, one nerve cell talks to the other nerve cell, but it talks to it in varying languages. Now, you did pioneering work in what is known as synaptic transmission. Maybe just explain what that is a bit and also explain how that aided our understanding of the brain and how it works. So when you think again about the brain and these networks of cells that communicate with each other at synapses, the process of the information transfer is called synaptic transmission. That is basically the process by which one cell talks to the other cell. We need to understand this because it's the most fundamental component, if you want, that enables the brain to work at all. 
Mm. That is what makes the brain sort of pick. <laughs> it's a bad metaphor. <laughs> okay. Just think about it. In the simplest case, you have a nerve that goes to your muscle. The nerve sends a signal to the muscle. It does so at a synapse. In this case, the cell that receives the signal is the muscle. It's not another nerve cell, but it's basically the same thing. Mm. The nerve tells the muscle to do something. In this case, to contract because it's a muscle cell. So synaptic transmission is the transfer of that information. And that's what I've been working on in my career because I feel it's really simple to understand the most fundamental features of synaptic transmission in order to understand diseases. We're talking with Professor uh, Thomas Sudoff of the Stanford University School of Medicine. And Professor Sudoff will be taking part as a speaker in the Global Young Scientists Summit 2021 here next week, uh, January 12th to 15th, uh, by the uh, National Research Foundation here in Singapore. Uh, I assume you'll be doing that remotely, Professor, not coming uh, this way? Yes, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. It's been coming for a while. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we'd love to have you travel over this way whenever it's safe to do so, of course. But uh, in the meantime, you know, my mother suffers from dementia. And when you look at this work that you're doing, I understand that it does have implications for brain disorders like autism, schizophrenia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. How, how, does, that, how does that work? And, and are you making any strides in trying to figure out how to cure or remediate these diseases in some way? We are intensely interested in trying to apply our work. But at this point, in understanding the brain, we really do not understand the most fundamental questions. In particular, in Alzheimer's disease, we don't understand why it happens and what happens. Mm. We can describe it. What happens is that the synapses are the first to die. After the synapses die, the person can think anymore as well. Mm -hmm. Then the neurons die, and people suffer from tremendous impairments, dementia. But why that is so is unclear. Drug companies have spent billions of dollars following up leads that emerged very early on, but these were kind of red herrings. They were basically things that turned out to be leading to nothing. And so now we and others are back to square one, so to speak, to try to figure out what is actually happening in these diseases and how can we stop the synapses from dying? Mm. I think there's a good chance we'll make a progress. But you know, one thing in science is you don't know what the progress will be because you don't know what you're going to discover. You can't actually script scientific progress. You can't sort of tell scientists, you have to discover this next and we have to discover this, that. You really have to basically let them explore the question and yeah. try to find an answer to the questions before you can go to applications. Yeah. We're speaking with Nobel Prize winner, uh, Professor Sudoff. Uh, and so, Professor Sudoff, I wanted to ask you on that point. There is no time frame, but obviously people tend to be impatient if they're suffering from the disease. Listening to you there it reminds me of a recent interview I saw with Michael J. Fox, who is arguably... It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mantle he wouldn't want, but arguably the world's most famous sufferer of Parkinson's disease. He set up a foundation. He's raised more than a billion dollars. He said when he first realized he had Parkinson's disease in the 90s, he expected to see a cure in his lifetime. 20 years and a billion dollars later, he's not so confident. And as we deal with an aging population, both in Singapore and the world, where we're seeing more of these mental disorders because we have aging populations, how, how do you feel on that in terms of confidence, in terms of progress? Where do you think we are in terms of treating these kind of disorders like Parkinson's, like Alzheimer's? You know, that's an incredibly important question because the people who suffer from these diseases, of course, they would love to have treatments as soon as possible. So would we all. But you can't jump over things. You can't just basically play roulette and try, well, this looks comforting. Let's put a million billion dollars here and we, we might work out. We don't know what works out. I think Parkinson's disease is a good example. As it's Alzheimer's disease, what happens if you spend a billion dollars on the possible ability that there may be something there without actually going seriously after the root of the problem? Hmm. So I think 
everybody in the field is now realizing we really have to understand the basics first. You can't just hope that you're going to cure it by sort of thinking, well, this is a way or how we can apply ideas that are not yet well developed until we understand these diseases. We don't know. So specifically for Alzheimer's disease, yes, it could happen in a couple of years if we can discover how to understand the disease. But I don't know if we can discover that in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. At this point, we don't know why the disease happens. We only know there's a lot of genes, they're important, but we don't know how to actually do something about it. Mm. And only after we really have done the basics, the blue sky research, trying to understand the brain, trying to understand what happens in the brain when it's disease, can you actually spend the billions of dollars in developing drugs? Because otherwise you're just guessing. A quick follow-up on that, Professor. You know, again, laymen would be listening to this thinking, but why? What, what, what are we missing? What is the gap? What are we missing in our fundamental understanding of the brain? You say we need to understand more. Uh, there's a gap in our knowledge. I mean, obviously, if you knew what it was, you would fix it. But in broad terms, what is that gap that is stopping us from getting from A to B? What is that fundamental uh, gap in our knowledge that's stopping us from understanding the most fundamental thing to our existence, the human brain? What, what is missing here? That is a question that keeps me awake at night. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it is very early in the morning. Sorry. <laughs> you know, we understand so little, and everybody, depending on what kind of neuroscientist you talk to, they will give you a different answer. Mm. The fact is, there's so much we are missing, I don't even know where to start. Wow. Okay? It's just, we know so little about the brain at this point, about the most basic aspects of the brain, about how it works. Knowing the principles of synaptic transmission, part of which I was lucky enough to be involved in understanding, was a progress. But that's tiny. You know, this, <laughs> this is a big challenge. Just think about cancer. On cancer, we as societies have spent at least 10 times as much in terms of research money, probably 100 times as much as on the brain. Mm. Okay, What do we know? Mm. How many cancers can we actually treat? And it's so much simpler. I mean, the brain is definitely going to be more complex than a cancer cell. Just think about that comparison. I mean, it's, it's insane, I'm sorry, to expect that with this little amount of engagement, that little amount of research that has been done, that we will understand it. Of course we won't. If we even can't understand a cancer cell with a 10 to 100-fold bigger investment, it's just that's the way it is. And I'm hoping... We'll luck out, at least for the major diseases, because that would make all the difference. Yeah. But you know, you can't plan it. Yeah. It's impossible. But you know what you're going to get at. Professor Sudoff, we have, we have time for just a couple, uh, two more quick questions, from, and they're coming from our listeners. Uh, the first question is uh, from Sky Lee. Has Alzheimer's per population been the same over the years, uh, or is it being influenced by diet or lifestyle? <clears throat> Excuse me. Good that's question. A, that's Good the question. first question. Uh, secondly, can we learn anything by um, uh, looking at the brain functions of our, of our uh, simian uh, our simian relatives uh, in the animal kingdom. Is there anything we can learn from, from their brains that might be applicable in the work that you're working on? So those two questions for you. With regards to the first question, the incident has changed to some extent because simply we get older, mm. but we also live more healthy. It has also changed because we know more about neurodegeneration and there's different types of neurodegeneration that are sometimes related and sometimes not. So that's it's a semantic question. In the end, people suffer. Mm. So overall, there probably is a change. Lifestyle probably plays a role, but it all depends on definitions and age and factors like this. So it's not as clear-cut to say yes or no. But there is, I think, quite compelling evidence that an active intellectual life is, and an active metabolism is helpful with this way. The second question about using non-human primates in research, I think that's an ethical question that I feel is fully justified if there's a compelling reason, because in the end, if you really want to test a drug, you have to be sure that it's safe. And for that reason, I think non-human primates are ethically justifiable and should be used. 
But I think that in order to understand disease processes itself, there's a lot we can learn actually from human patients and from using in vitro methods that mimic the human disorder that has a lot of promise for progress. Professor Sudoff, thank you so much. We have to leave it there. Professor Thomas Sudoff, the Avram Goldstein Professor in the School of Medicine at Stanford University. Uh, professor will be uh, speaking at the Global Young Scientists Summit 2021 uh, next week here from the 12th to the 15th of January, courtesy of the National Research Foundation here in Singapore. Professor, thanks for your time today. We look forward to talking with you in the future as hopefully more uh, breakthroughs occur. I hope there will be some. Yes. Thank you very much for your interest.